everyone and welcome to our event Helping Couples to Improve Their Communication with Mike Trier. Mike, a warm welcome back to online events. Thanks. It's great to have you here with us as part of our Working with Couples conference today. Mm. So, yeah. Very excited to be here. I've really enjoyed um, listening to Kate and Alan. Um, and I wish they were still here, that we could have a little bit of a chat with them, sort of like this, but obviously we're not quite there with online events, are we? We're not quite there, that's right, yeah. Yeah, we are just thinking that would have been lovely to kind of overlap some of the conversations and, yeah. Yeah, so there's been a lot to think about today. Mike, sorry I was interrupting you there. Yeah. No, no, no. Well, I'd just say, can I say hi to the audience, to the, to the, the chat room audience, you know, and whether you're actually chatting or you're just there, you know, I'd like to say hi. Um, any chance we could sort of hear where a few people are from? If you want to just type in where you're from, is that is that allowed? Am I allowed to ask that, ask that question? You're, like, you're allowed, Mike. Yes, absolutely. Interactive or something like that. You know? Yes. Tell yes. me where you're from. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, it's always lovely to hear that. And while colleagues are typing away, Mike, do you want to say where you are or where you're from? Right. Okay. Well, my practice is in Sheffield. Um, I've got a private practice. And part of that is I'm a relate licensed counsellor, um, so I get a lot of uh, couples th through that. But I'm, in, I'm independent as well, so I see individuals and I see um, uh, quite a lot of supervisees, do the odd sort of workshop and that kind of stuff. Yeah, And you write as well, Mike, that's a part of your work too. Yeah, that's interesting. I have written a few articles, but I haven't. I'm not well. I suppose I've just done one now. Actually, should yeah. I say? Yes. Read slow, sort of. Your, sort <laughs> yes. Let's do the pointing thing. Like right below the video window, there's a link to the article that you've written for this event. Yeah. Um, because I don't know where we're going to go now. I might, you know, might lose my ability to communicate completely. But at least then you've got the 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 um, the article, which which says what I would want to say. You know, I mean, what we what I'll actually say now, I don't know. <laughs> yes. So whatever happens, colleagues can get a sense of what you've been thinking about as you've been um, preparing for the event, and that gives us the freedom just to be together Indeed. in the conversation as a whole group, I guess, and, exactly. and just get into that. Indeed. Yeah. And uh, what? Well, so we got someone from uh, Bonn. I can see that. Lovely. Uh, yeah. Well, both of us are in the the UK, aren't we? So um, it's nice to have contact with colleagues and places other than where we are. So yeah, that's nice. And I've just had a nice email from someone in America because they just read my article because it's been up there for a while. They've just they've, they've read it and liked it. So that's always a bit of a boost when that happens. It's lovely, isn't it? So the link to the article is just below the video window. Um, so it'd be great to click on it, grab the article. If you're watching this in the library, it's not going to be below the video, but it will be in the resource guide. Um, and you'll, you'll see that link just further down the page. Just click on there and the article, the link to the article will be in there. Yeah, fantastic. I've, I've got another question I'd like to ask the um, audience. I'm just curious how many people actually do counsel couples or have or perhaps even would like to. I mean, if you do, perhaps you could just press the C button on your on, on your keyboard so we just see how many Cs we get, as it were. Yeah, yeah. So if people are, have or are currently working with couples, press C. If people would like to do this kind of work, what, what letter would you suggest? L. L for like, that's a great. Oh. great. <laughs> so C if you're doing it already, and L for would like to, as it were. Great. Great. Oh, so we've got a C already. We've also got a colleague in from York, so that's lovely. Thank you for that location. Right. And can you see Angela's comment yes. there as well? Yeah. Um, do you have a question for them? Well, I did. I did actually post um, a question for them, which, which is about um, childhood uh, relationships. I was just curious if they're interested in their clients' early childhood experiences, because some counsellors are quite interested in that because they feel it informs. So the current situation, personally, if it comes up, it comes up for me. Whereas I, I like to stay pretty well in the present, you know. But I'd just be curious to know what um, Kate and Alan's take on on sort of early childhood experiences is. Mm, yeah, because Angela is part of the Counselling Works team, I guess, with um, with Alan and Kate, who were on the previous event. So, hi, Angela. It's great you're still with us and. 
joining us up to Alan and Kate. Um, so if there's some feedback from the question, that would be great. So, I and mean... We've, we've got another colleague in from Doncaster. I think we're getting more C's and we've got an L. So lovely that there's a colleague thinking about doing this kind of work. Thank you for this feedback. Right. Oh, great. I was wondering whether I could do a little bit of linking to some of the points that Alan and um, Kate were, were bringing up. Because, um, you know, a lot of what... They, I, I feel really pleased to be following on from them. Sort of, you know, I think it's quite an honour, actually. Um, there are many person-centred um, sort of couples councils around, and, and not many that actually sort of talk about how they, they use their theory in their work, you know. And, and I say that... Um, you know, I agree with, with quite a lot of what they do, but in some cases, I'm, I'm different. So I don't know whether it's worth me. So I think one of the businesses I think is very important is the points they made is that it is different with two people in the room than with just one person. And they were saying it's very important to not take sides. And I, and I totally agree with that. I think it's very important. There were sort of questions at the end about World War Three, for example, and anger and stuff. Now, it's interesting because I see part of my role as holding the couple. And it's, 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 I don't use words to do it, I think. And it's difficult to... I think it's perhaps being a teacher and, and having taught in difficult um, inner-city schools that I, I seem to be able to, to hold the class so that usually the emotional temperature stays low. And in fact, often... Um, couples say, well, we can't talk in this way when we're on our own, but having you here, we're able to. So, um, and I don't quite know how I do it, but I do. So it, it's, I don't often get um, anger um, expressed strongly. So It's interesting that that is a real fear with us as practitioners, but like I think Kate and Alan were saying something similar, that actually yeah. the I, the frequency of that kind of anger that we imagine is very yes. low. And, yes. and and there's something about your presence, Mike, that you think is having an impact? Or is... Yes. I mean, because I remember when I was a rather unsuccessful teacher, you know, the, the class would be rather noisy and suddenly it would go quiet. I think, oh, have I finally cracked it? But of course, uh, an experienced teacher would have come in and just their presence mm. would be enough to, to, to calm the class. And I seem to have got something of that when I'm in the when I'm in the in the in the room with clients. And so another point I'd like to make is that I don't really see it as counselling. I, I see it as more that uh, a couple are bringing their relationship to supervision. Mm -hmm. So it feels more like a supervision than than than, than counselling, or even some kind of training. Um, so how would how would you make that difference, Mike? What is in terms of as you think about that? What's like? Why do you not see it as therapy? And I, I know you're kind of helping us to separate the two out, but what are the differences? Or? Oh God, my mind's gone complete. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. I've totally put you on the spot and shone a big bright light on and, that. And also, yeah. I think it's something a bit more like I remember my training. I mean, you know, I'm talking about communication now. So there are lots of things that I, I focus on. I just thought today, with only an hour, I'd focus on communication. And um, it reminds me very much of my training at Temenos. That um, we'd have a mixture of group therapy, a group process, but we'd also go into triads. So it feels like a triad that um, that I'm with, that I'm perhaps the observer, and there's they take it in terms of being the counsellor and the client in a sense, and I'm hoping to um, to uh, improve that process, I suppose. Well, I'd say improve is the wrong word, because that, that sounds like I'm doing something to them. But I think in the same way that when I was in triads over a number of years, I think my communication, my understanding, my empathy improved. I'm hoping that by giving the couple the opportunity to communicate with each other, to focus on the communication, that they will, in the end, learn to become a bit more empathic, to read each other, to ultimately be more supportive, really. Right, right. That's really interesting, comparing the work to the triads that we do as we train as therapists. Because, I mean, we hope there's that kind of natural capacity for empathy and for valuing of the other person. But we can also need to work really hard to tune those skills, I guess, and to... Exactly. So you're a trainer, so and, and Kate and Alan are a trainer. So if they're in their training mode, to what extent do they, you know, offer something specific to 
their, their trainees, and is it exactly the same as they would be with with clients, or is it a bit more? So, and it's certainly, I think, different from from um, one to one. I mean, I, I think people often make the orchestra analogy: is that a solo singer doesn't need the conductor, but an orchestra probably does. Mm -hmm. So, I think there is some measure of holding when when, when there's. A, so, if I'm facilitating a group, my my sort of holding is different from when I've say got a, an individual person. Right. Right, yeah, so there's that analogy of, yeah, the orchestra finds yeah. the having the conductor really useful and potent to the process. Yes. Yeah. So are there things that you do then, Mike? Like th things that you might offer to the couple, like to be the conductor in that experience? Or? Well, that's in a sense what I'd like to discuss with yeah. Kate and Ella. I mean, that's the crucial issue, perhaps from a person-centred perspective. I don't like the term directive. I think in the previous chat room, somebody said it talked about directive. Um, I actually like the word more. So, in other words, it's almost like is you're either directive or you're you're non-directive. But I think that there's a middle position which is suggestive. And so I might tentatively suggest stuff, but I would try and do it um, within the, the the client's framework or near it. And obviously it's my understanding of where the, the, the client's framework is. So I think if I suggest something that was way out of their framework, it, it just wouldn't work. Um, but in a sense, I'm perhaps also wanting to, to, to hope they'll come a little bit out of their comfort zone and, and, and try something different. Because I think it's difficult to change. And I think in a sense, couples are coming along, they do want to change. Um, you know, if they're arguing or um, they just don't feel they're emotionally connected or they can't compromise, whatever it is, they're coming specifically, but more overtly than one-to-one -one counselling, they want some changes. That, that is definitely right from the beginning, that's what they want. Right, so it's very clear on the agenda, couples wanting the relationship to be different, to feel yes. different, and yes. yeah. And they're often quite desperate, they've tried everything else, and mm -hmm. on, on the last resort, you know, and there's a bit of shame and stigma. Oh my God, we've got to come to counselling, you know. Yes, well, it's, it's often, it's like plumbing, isn't it? Nobody calls a plumber in when the tap's dripping. Um, I well, went to home, my house is flooding, I guess, which is crazy, really. But, well, I often, I often say that. I, I'd say, you know, no one pays me good money to come and tell me their relationship's fantastic, you know. Yeah. They're either at the edge, um, or in some cases over the edge, hanging on by a root, you know, so... Yeah. And hopefully we can, somehow they'll help them crawl back a bit away from the end, you know. So. Yes, yeah, to kind of pull back up over the, the cliff face. And I, I, I really like what you, I'm really curious about what you're saying about it can be easy to go, are you directive, yes or no? Yes. But maybe there's a continuum and there's something about, like, are you saying that, like, maybe what you might suggest is coming from your experience of their frame of reference like you're like from your experience of where you you find them or you feel they are it's, it's interesting i mean i often think that couples go through a number of stages i mean most couples i say when they come they feel pretty desperate but usually they've been in a position before when they felt their relationship was working so we might call it the honeymoon period when they seem to be getting on and um they were finding communication relatively easy then the pressures come, and they've kind of lost that sense of connection. They've lost that loving thing, as it were. Yes, okay, we could do the song. <laughs> we're not going to, well, maybe you are going to sing, I'm not sure. But. Uh, no, no, definitely not. <laughs> um, so I suppose what I'm then is helping to perhaps a third stage, whereby they can face the difficult, the new pressures and stresses, um, but can still do it feeling connected. Yeah, so, so seeing the journey, or I guess, of the relationship and the different stages that it's in, yeah? Yes, I think so. So, so in other words, I'm building on something which is there. You know, I may have to dig down to it. I love Elaine's phrase yesterday, drilling down. I may have to drill down to um, the, the foundation where their relationship was working. But I don't think they'd be... It's very rare that they'd actually be coming to a couples counselling unless they did want to, um, to improve it. Yeah, and so as part of what you're doing, kind of helping the client think about those stages, maybe refer back to times when it was working well, is that...? Uh... I, 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 I sort of gloss over it, um, 
in a sense. And the same thing about um, you know childhood experiences. So get the, the question I'd, I'd be asking Kate now, because I, I don't bother terribly much about that. I like to be very present centred. So I don't make a big deal out of it. I think they might find it reassuring. I mean, in the first session, they people normally come with their plates actually brimming. And in a sense, in the first session, they're just well, I'm just hearing what they've each says in their plate. So they, I'm not really expecting by the end of the session it to be any resolution. But I, I found they, they normally felt there's normally a sense of relief. At least we've been able to say it. What, what, what's in the plate, as it were? Mm. Yeah. Like that, that experience in itself can be really helpful just to feel like there's somewhere to come and and describe what's in our plate and say this is what I'm living with and yes. and and I guess you can offer that experience to both partners in a couple so that they're not getting oh but you're not listening to me like you can hear that really deeply for each person yeah in, indeed I, I don't I don't suffer really a problem I mean at the beginning I, I like to be as um, you know sort of I obviously start off by talking about um, confidentiality. There's, there's an added bit about confidentiality because I, I always say that um, there's an internal confidentiality that I can't have one of them ringing me up to talk about the other. Mm. In a sense, anything that gets said has to be sent in the room. I mean, sometimes I might negotiate individual sessions. It's interesting the other way around to Alan Kate. I normally start with couples and then when the time comes, I might have an individual session. Um, but, but anyway, um, in, 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 in the first session, we're just, um, they're each in their own way, um, telling me what their issues are. And, and there's never a sort of, um, the sort of dominance. They normally look at each other and it's almost like, after you, no after you. you know? No one necessarily particularly wants to start. <laughs> right, okay. Some person starts and, and, they, and, and they, they talk and then you know, the other person will come in. I, I, it's normally a fairly natural process. I don't think I have to kind of orchestrate that very, very um, sort of strongly in any way. It's, it, it's a sort of natural thing, really. Mm. Mm. Like the couple and you can find the rhythm together in terms of yes, communication. Yes, way. It's a little bit like a dance, you know. I'm perhaps watching them dance, you know, and to mm. sort of, um, I'm just going, I'm doing ballroom dancing myself, my partner. It's not going terribly well. <laughs> okay. I'm not natural, you know. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, so but, but I can watch other people's dance, you know, and... Uh, it just it's interesting seeing how it goes really yeah. so as you watch the dance i guess that's a powerful metaphor i think yes. because as a couple kind of um bring themselves into the room and, and i guess part of what we're here to talk about is like how we might help the couples improve their communication and like you you can see how the couple communicates yes. with you and with each other and yes i mean it's it's difficult because Sometimes, as I say, the first stage they're just basically offloading and they can just spend the whole ses first session offloading. Um, and then I can just say, well, I'm really sorry, but we've got to finish now. Um, do you want to book another session? Because I, I normally tell people, come for one session, see what it's like. And I like them to have a little bit of a taste for what it's like. Um, and uh, people do in all sorts of different ways. Sometimes they do go back to their early childhood. You know, some people, got, some people have done therapy themselves. You know, people, I don't really mind how they do it. They just have to find their own way of talking about it. Yeah. And um, I, I, I think you'd probably find it helpful I summarise what I've heard. Mm. Um, so then there's the question, well, where do you want to come back? Um, at some point, when, it's, when we've sort of moved away from the offloading bit, we'll sort of say, well, I'm now talking about particularly communication. If communication seems to an issue, and I think it often is, I, I would say 90% of my clients, whatever is other issues they're bringing, I would say that uh, communication is an important component of that. Mm. Um, so one of the things we, we I start off doing is looking at their communication patterns. How do they communicate um, throughout the day? And one of the things I like to look at is what I call transitions. So when they're part, when say in the morning they've been together and they're parting, or more important when they've been apart and they they um, they come together. So I mean, if you don't mind me asking you, John, I mean, does it, are you ever in that situation? Are you ever been you've been apart from your partner or anybody else, and then you come together? I mean, how how do you hand how do you handle that bit yourself? You know, we talked about this before, didn't we? And of course, um, I've got we or oh, we've got our little dog Charlie in the house. So when I come home, 
and of course my partner those times when she's at home already of course Charlie's gone crazy and it's really easy for me to go oh hello Charlie how are you doing and I go a bit crazy and and actually I'm not paying my partner any attention in those first moments or yeah, is, is that what you would notice, Mike? I guess. Well, well, exactly, and, and I think it's a parallel with, with young children. I mean, if you've got one partner that's been home all day with small children and going stir crazy mm. um, and really wants some adult attention, but their partner's been at work all day and their, their body may have physically moved through the door, but, you know, their head's elsewhere. Yeah. Um, so each of them have got different needs. Each, in a sense, wants... The other to meet their need and neither's sort of able to do that mm. and then if you've got well okay if you've got yapping dogs or whatever those yappings are sort of fair but if you've got small children daddy 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 well, mommy 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 you know sort of um yeah. it's that's a difficult transition to make and i think there's something about the the different styles i guess my partner will maybe take more time to kind of say how hard day's been and yes. what it's been like I'm a bit more like Charlie, where I'm like, you'll never guess what happened today. And then chat, 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 chat. And it, especially if I've come out of that kind of very dynamic environment, like it can take a little bit of time just to almost match up so that we can find a way to communicate, I guess, in those diff very different styles. Absolutely. I mean, this is where I would say I'm suggestive, not directive. Okay. I do have um, some ideas about managing that transition, which I think people are sometimes desperate to try something. So I'll say, well, here are a few things you can try out. You know, mm. you can try these at home. So I, I normally find it's the person that's, you know, the person that's in the house, for better or worse, is established. Whereas the person coming through the door isn't. And I think it's fine for, that, for the person who's coming in. It's okay their need is to kind of orientate themselves. And, as, and, as, and, you know, if they want 10, 20 minutes to do whatever they need to, to, um, to have a shower, to look at their emails, change, have a cup of tea, whatever, as well, and particularly if it's negotiated. So they come in and say, so, so it's not, I think it's not the time, personally, to start saying, how was your, your day? I think that should come at a later stage. Um, I, I think, really, it's really important how you greet. That's what I feel, you know, eye contact's the most important thing. If you have physical contact, that depends on the couple, but I think it's really important... The eye contact. Um, and if that transition works, then it sets the, or doesn't work, it sets the tone for the rest of the evening or sometimes beyond. So I normally say, greet, and then, you know, if you need a bit, a bit of a break, take that break. Even if World War Three has broken out in the rest of the house, you probably will be more effective if you take a little break. I mean, I have one couple when I asked them how long the break was, and, and one of them says, well, about four hours. Wow. This okay. person was so anxious from work, they needed four hours, by which time their partner's ready for bed. So I think four hours is a bit long. But I think, I personally, 10, 20 minutes, um, just the second partner, just um, doing whatever they need to, to relax and to uh, orient. But I don't, I'm curious to know what the uh, chat room, what, what do you think, people in the chat room? Do you, how do you manage transitions? Do you, do, you, do you feel that you'd like a little bit of a break to orientate yourself or do you allow your partner to have a bit of a break I and mean, what, what works for you in a sense you know? great so we can get some feedback there sandra is also just letting me know that i think the page with the chat room on it is buffering a little bit so i think I've, there's a group of colleagues who are on our backup stream right. that doesn't have the chat room on it but i i'm also noticing that you c if colleagues are on the backup stream without the chat room if you can switch windows, you can have the live the video on the window with the chat room just paused. So you can type in there if you still want to, but also listen to us on the other page. Um, so that might feel like a bit of a techie thing. Um, it might be worth chatting, but just for just to notice if there, if it takes a little while longer, I guess, to get some feedback, it might be because colleagues are having to switch pages. Right, because I've noticed actually my uh, chat room seems to have frozen, so I don't know whether I should do anything, but um, that, yes. are it, it, is that really, everything losing everything or something like that? Yeah, or it could be that everybody's on the other page where it's a little bit smoother. It could be that and not able to type in. So, okay. yeah. Well, let's see what happens. And I, I mean, I think what I'm noticing about what you're saying, Mike, which is really helpful, is 
like I notice in my relationship, we have different assumptions about how to engage. Yes. And something about um, when that's agreed, like, like if one of us has to take a little bit of time, and the other one of us is not like I might. I'm not thinking. Oh, my partner doesn't want to talk to me, and yes. I've had a cr but it's just like, well, let's just take some time, and then we can chat with each well, other. That's a very yeah. important point because again, I think it links what some of the other earlier people have said um, that people can feel hurt, mm -hmm. and people make assumptions about what is what's going on. So that's why ideally, I'd like to discuss it. What do you feel about this? Mm -hmm. So if, me, if I say, well, what do you feel about letting your partner have a little bit of time um, for, but then obviously you've got some more kids, they've got a fully engaged sort of thing. If we discuss that, if I mention it as an idea, and it very often hasn't even occurred to them. Mm -hmm. So if I mention it, they don't have to. But I, I find that most people are quite receptive of that, and a few people are. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and especially that, like, we often don't notice how we relate. And we, we think everybody relates, well, I'm guilty of this, everybody relates in the way that I do, but of course it's not the case, you know, and it's, yeah, yeah. I, can you see that comment in the chat room there? Um, I think it is important to wait, and yes. Mike, your suggestion to chat about the day is much more helpful too, so yeah, thank you for that. Indeed, so, so that would be my second thing that happened, is that I, again, I, I, it's a suggestion, not a direction. But I, I suggest that people set up um, some quality time each day, quality communication time, uh, 10 minutes a day. Um, and and mm -hmm. we can, I, can, I can talk about how you spend the time, but actually I find it's more important that they actually recognise. Very often couples just don't allow themselves any space for communication. And therefore they're tense and communication can quickly escalate into some kind of argument or perhaps the same old argument. Whereas I, I'm wanting to, in order to, to, to bring about the change, they, to facilitate the change they want, I'm saying, I'm not going to change your patterns. I'm going to set some new patterns alongside your resistant ones and try it out, you know. So how about, you know, when, when you, each day try and set up 10 minutes when you're going to be doing some quality communication. And it, it really, if we're going to use a biblical expression, it really separates the sheep from the goats because... Some people find it enormously difficult. They come back next session and say, yeah, we did it once, and then we just couldn't find the time, which is totally understandable. Mm -hmm. But it's equally interesting. The people that, that persevere and set up a regular pattern, they sometimes call it by a name, or we, we have our cup of tea, whatever it is. And if people are really, it's a bit like the triad. People are setting up some time to go and do a triad, or, 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 or a dyad in this case. You know, um, and... Um, well, oh, it's great. amazing on a course how easily the time slips away and suddenly the students have managed to not do a triad like, yes. because it's tricky to do that stuff and maybe as couples we yes. we find it hard to make those times in the week like it's yes. not easy to establish that habit or something and, yes yeah. and sometimes people give me feedback that they feel it's a bit formal it's a bit particularly on the exercise you a bit structured you know shouldn't there be spontaneity but as I said, I really do feel it's difficult to change. I find it difficult to change. Um, I, I think a lot of people find it difficult to change. And therefore, to actually, we have to consciously change. It's a bit like sort of learning to ride a bicycle. To begin with, you're kind of very conscious of every movement. And then the automatic part of your brain takes over. It's almost, that's what I want. I want us to consciously think about changing the communication patterns. And then hopefully it will eventually kick in so that you, we're, we've got these improved communication patterns sort of set up. That could be a bit idealistic, but that's that's my aim. Well, again, bearing in mind what Kate and um, Alan were saying, I've got to be careful of my words. I'm not sort of trying to force anything on them, but in a sense, they're wanting some change, and change is difficult. So I'm feeling this is, this is a route that I found seems to work for lots of people. Right, right. So you're not presenting that to your client as right this is what works this is what will work for you it's a yeah. it's a possibility and yes. and maybe if it feels a bit clunky well maybe that's right actually because new things do feel clunky and yes yeah. I, th I think that's it i mean i have again i have ground rules now again i, I don't know whether in training courses um you'd have ground rules or when you, when one meets a, a supervisor the first time do we do we or counsel first time, do we have sort of work establish 
how we're going to operate. Um, and again, so I've got I've got a set of ground rules which I would suggest as as works. So, for example, an obvious one is well, I'd be curious to know from the audience. Well, if, if you were um, supposing we're agreed that it might be good to try ten minutes a day of communication, quality communication. What kind of ground rules would you suggest? Maybe you think there shouldn't be any ground rules. I don't know, but if if there were, what what do you think? What ground rules do you think might work? It's interesting to think about that. Like, how do we um, contract with our partner? I guess yes, for exactly. conversation, uh, and maybe while we're uh, waiting for some feedback, there I know I've missed some feedback in terms of the last question. Is it okay to go back? Yeah, of course. Hear that, it's, and then it's, we. It's could, exactly, yeah, no, no. let's. I mean, I know we're kind of folding back a bit and coming forward, no, but no, um, yeah, and just noticing that comment there. Um, we greet each other. Give space if needed and relax. And and that comment was followed up by the colleague saying, but 20 years ago with four kids, dogs and washing, it stopped communication. <laughs> so, And the um, colleague saying that they've learned from that, learned from the intensity of that. So thank you. Um, another call, comment there, I think it's always good to greet warmly, kiss and a hug. Just acknowledge that you care. So, yeah. Yes, it's ideal, it's great, but some people are so alienated from each other, there's no, there's no way that they're going to kiss or hug. Or sometimes what happens is one person wants more physical contact and the other person definitely doesn't. So I think that has been negotiated. But I always think, you know, eye contact and, um, is a minimum, even if you're doing it from two foot away or whatever. You know, if you don't, you know, I think very often in relationships you have to find your right space. And when things aren't going terribly well in the relationship, the, the, the right space or the right distance is a bit more distant than, you know, in your honeymoon period. Mm, mm. And that, like that's having the therapist there and the couples counselling as a space where that could maybe be negotiated in a way that isn't about doing something to each other, yes. but just like, what do we both need? Um, Exactly. Yeah. But again, you know, it's in the director thing, I tend to, to position the two chairs. I've obviously three chairs in the room, three, three armchairs. So there's two and a slight angle to each other, and then there's me. So I, I in a sense, I am being directed just by, by, by setting that up, you could say. Mm -hmm. But it's normally, I, I set a space so that I normally have kind of tissues between them, they want water, um, and room if they want to grab each other by the hand, they can, you know, and sometimes they do. Yeah, so they're right. kind of close enough yes. if there's to be some contact, but far away enough that there's some space. And, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, one this is with... Oh, so there's yes, some other that's, comments coming that's in. That's really? very good. Yeah. I think it's really important. People can try very, very hard to make change. In fact, they've normally reported that's what happened. They've tried very, very hard and it never lasts. So I think that's a really good um, question, Nud. That's why I'm quite structured, you know, in a sense. Um, I, I'd like to see couples every two weeks, to be honest, rather than every week. Because, um, you know, in a sense, we might say, well, do you fancy trying out some communication? And then the following, if they come in two weeks' time, they, they know, oh, nasty teacher's going to sort of check what they've been doing and give us the detention. Although I try to say that's actually not the way it works, you know. But the thing is that if, if it's weekly, they normally try it and then they've given up. It hasn't worked. And that's what they uh, report. Whereas if it's two weeks, they've got a chance to try it out, it slips, and then themselves try it out again. So, I mean, I'm very up to what the clients want. And sometimes yeah. they do want weekly, you know, but mm. on the whole, fortnightly seems to be quite a good pattern for me, especially when people are short on money, you know. Yeah, so that's a framework. And, and how about, like, in, in terms of ground rules for those kind of 10-minute pieces of content, I've... Contact, have you got any suggestions you might make, Mike, for contracting or ground rules for a couple in conversation? Or? Okay, and I, I'd like to come back to Angela Turner's um, yes. uh, later on, okay, but I think yeah. I, let's, let's talk about, about ground rules. Mm. I mean, um, on allied issues, um, resources, I think the best resource I've ever had is look at my own relationships mm. or relationship, which hasn't been that brilliant, to be honest, and we have been together. 35 years, and I think my partner's very, very tolerant and very patient. God knows why she didn't leave me a long time ago. And I think we're a lot better now. But so, for example, I remember in an argument saying, you know, why are you so critical? And she asked me the same question, well, why are you so critical? Mm. And I suddenly realized she's absolutely right. 
you know, I can just allow bad things to drive me being critical without even being aware of it. So that, that really stopped me in my tracks. So I would say a ground rule is really important is not to be critical, not to be judgmental, mm. or to be accepting and tolerant, you know, sort of. Yeah, like how can we speak to each other in a way that isn't having a go, isn't chipping That's, away at the other? And, exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. And can you make, do you make any suggestions about how to do that? I mean, that can be a real stretch for us sometimes, depending on where we are in our life and our relationship or... Well, I, 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 I think it's interesting. I, I, I do like to suggest some ground rules when it seems appropriate. And if someone's being, if somebody is, in, is being critical, I will normally say, um, it, 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 so, it so depends. I don't even know exactly what I'd say, but mm -hmm. somehow it would, it would come out of the room that there's been some criticism there and make what will turn, and the trouble with criticism is that can be quite hurtful. Because again, I think arguments, you know, what I often point out is arguments can start by a little comment, which is a bit wounding. Mm. And then somebody feels wounded, so they say another comment back, which is, which is wounding back. Mm. And then, you know, the whole thing escalates, where, where whatever the, the, the argument starts on is lost. It's just become a mutual hurting session. Mm. Mm. So I think, so when, and when I point out that dynamic, most people say, yes, yes, they recognize that, you know. Yeah. So it's kind of like, how do we respond to each other without that little jab, I guess, that can exactly. kind of start that, exactly. yeah. yeah. So sometimes I find people are so hyped up that they keep um, being critical. Or well, another ground rule I like is, I speak for I. So you is a banned word. So again, you know, people might say, well, that's very directive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But... It feels that it works. And, and actually, quite honestly, people either be able to do it or they can't. And it's, again, something to think about. Um, third round rule is I'm saying, when you're setting up a quality communication time, talk about something neutral. Don't talk about the relationship. You're probably not ready to talk about the relationship. Right. Okay. So, so that's the time for me if you want to talk about your day. Because it's neutral. And also then to try and get in touch with the feeling component. So... Um, you know, I sometimes tell a little story. So rather than say, well, I went to an office, um, you know, I did a bit of filing, wrote a report and answered some emails. I say, you know, I went to a meeting and George was there. And my sort of heart sank when I saw it was George. It's really horrible um, when George is there because he can be so critical and nasty and undermining. And I looked around everybody in the room. I could see from their faces sort of sullenness. Everybody feels the same thing, you know. So you have this meeting with George droning on and on and on. And in the end, and you know, I, I'm angry with myself because I, I, won't, I won't tackle him. I'm, I'm afraid to tackle him because I'm worried that he'll jump down my throat and humiliate me in front of everybody else. At the end of the meeting, George has told us what to do and we know it won't work and we know we'll have to end up picking up the pieces. Well, that's just an example of, yeah. of how yeah. one can find the feeling component of, um, of ordinary activities. Yeah, yeah, which might be a skill, I guess, um, yeah. for the couple to, to bring that feeling in, I guess. Yes. Yeah. It, it yeah. is a skill. It is, it's definitely. And I'd rather they practiced um, on, when we're talking about something neutral rather than trying to practice when they're talking about some bone of contention. Yes, yeah, because there's going to be a lot of feeling perhaps in a way that isn't helpful in that. So, yeah, so the, a 10 minute time. Uh, uh, a time and a place that's kind of manageable for the couple and not about the relationship, not about the hot topics that are bringing the couple yes. to therapy. Yeah. I mean, if we think about Roger's stages of process, I feel there's an analogous with couples. That I mean, sometimes, so the stages are that I want people to first of all be aware of their own feelings. I want them to be able to put words to them and tell their partner what their feelings are. I want then I want them to be aware of their own their partner's feelings, be able to read their, their partner's feelings. And then in a sense, well then it's a question of needs. What are my partner's needs? What are my needs? And how can we go about meeting those needs? So I do feel there's a sequence it's, and that people come in at a particular point in that sequence. Mm -hmm. um, so in a sense, whatever they're doing is hopefully having the effect that they're they're becoming more empathic to themselves and to their partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and maybe that's helpful for the work too, if you can see clients moving through those stages, I guess. And, yes, uh, yes. Can give you some confidence that it's working or it's, it's, it's kind of helpful. Or, 
Yes, and it's interesting because so usually there's some empathy there. It's just a bit buried, maybe because of hurt or whatever. And sometimes I find that somebody is very empathic in the workplace, and yet they're not. Their partner reports they're not in the home. So it's, it's that's a bit odd. But at least it's something to build on. Well, you've been empathic there. Now, now come and do it in the home, sort of thing. You know. Yeah. So, yeah, so f- listening closely to see what resources the couple has between yes. them, I, I guess, as individuals. And, yeah, yeah. So I think, I think that they were, they were the, the, the ground rules. I think are really important. Um, um, speaking for I, not you, um, not being critical or, or judgmental or fault-finding, um, and to begin with, trying to talk about something neutral and really trying to get in the feeling content. Yeah. That, that's, that's, that's what, in a sense, I'd say, well, here's what, what I, I'd, I'd like people to have a go at. You know, I, I don't, people do sometimes say, oh, I don't want to do with that. But not, not normally about that. People normally ex- reasonably accepting about the ground rules. They may not be able to do it, you know. Right, okay, okay. It's like when I've counseled been counseling to, well run groups for kids for teenagers you know we'll say well, what are the ground rules and they say well don't interrupt each other so we write it up don't interrupt and they interrupt each other all the time so <laughs> <laughs> that's right yeah yeah well and i just noticed in that comment what about asking the clients what would be okay with them i guess and that like maybe the the couple might set some of their own ground rules that maybe they Yes, can manage, or? I'd always prefer to work with the client's own material, that's def- definitely it. So that's why we start with what are your communication patterns mm-hmm. throughout the day. Mm-hmm. And I'd like to kind of build on what they, what they do always. Yeah. Uh, but if, if they're very kind of wound up, um, that they're not necessarily able to kind of think very clearly. So, so it's almost like teacher asking a question. Well, what do you think you'd like? What do you think would work for you? What What do you think we should have the ground rules? Some of them are just their 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 working memories. The way I look at it, they're just full up. They haven't got enough processing space to be able to um, to to think about that. Yeah. Which is why I find it's helpful to to stick in the feelings domain and, and leave the cognitive side to one side. Yeah, yeah, and I guess in the session that if then if you've got some things for the client to try, yes. That almost they can maybe what would work for them can come as they start to relax into the, maybe they start with the activity you suggest it doesn't really work but the, it allows them to f- free up some of that working memory some of the their cognitive capacity or... absolutely well I think it's, that's why I think it's important that the emotional temperature is low in the room because then I think they've got more processing capacity when they're when they're sort of the emotional temperature is high, one of the consequences is that is their memory is full. They haven't got any spare processing capacity. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's come out, I suppose, the work on anger I've done with teenagers. But I think it's always a calm atmosphere. It's always going to be more helpful and effective than a sort of... I mean, I know it's interesting what Alan and, and Kate were saying. Well, sometimes people are very angry. They've just got to get it out. Mm. But... It's kind of not on my watch, sort of thing, you know. Right, okay. So you would think differently about that, Mike? I think I would think differently. Yeah, so c- can you give us a sense of how you would think about that? or, or Yeah. Well, as I say, usually it happens that um, I- I'm calm somehow, and it's, I think it's tone of voice, sometimes slow. I mean, sometimes if people are being very fast, I might kind of slow my own voice down or even put a hand signal up and kind of stop, you know. Um and I think that helps. I mean, once or twice people have got so angry, they've walked out. Mm. But then it's, it's really hard for them. I mean, it doesn't happen very often, and they usually come back. But then suddenly there's a lot of shame that they've kind of lost it. Mm. Mm. And then to come back, it's, it's really difficult for them, you know. So in a sense, I'd, I'd rather um, that the emotional temperature was was low enough and that that kind of thing's not going to happen exactly. yeah so something about like helping the client to stay out of overwhelm and just to stay in that place where it's not it's just not too hot in the room i guess yes yeah i mean there are some gender issues this is the problem i find is when it, i mean I, I i do couple counsel same-sex couples and frankly i i actually i really like counseling uh, gay couples because i'm actually there's three guys in the room together and 
when it, you know, it's, it's, again, there's something I find difficult to put into words, but there's something very good about three men being together. Mm. And most of my work is with, um, with uh, you know, a man and a woman, and therefore there's going to be some gender issues. And I, I often find myself having to think on the hoof about this, you know. Mm. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm hard, I would say I, I do try and not take sides, but I'm, in my own head I'm sometimes harder on the men than I am on the, the women. I think, oh God, you men, you know, you're not communicating effectively. This is myself, I'd never actually say this. Right, okay, okay, but some of your own it's things. Better, you know. So. Yeah. But I realised that's no good because that, then the danger would be um, that I'd be saying, oh, come on, you guy, you've got to improve your communication skills. And actually, sometimes it's the other way around. You know, it, it's it's not um, it's not always one one gender or the other. But actually, what I often find is that. Um, Sometimes men get overwhelmed by feelings. Um, they're not used to very strong feelings themselves, and therefore they <coughs> easily get overwhelmed by their partner's feelings. And then, of course, they think they're being attacked, and they'll just put defences up. So um, sometimes I find myself almost like one partner's got to turn the volume up on their emotional expression, and the other one's almost got to turn the volume down a bit, you know, meet in the middle, you know. Mm, mm. Yeah, and that, I think that also makes sense in the light of Angela's comments about maybe one of the clients might have some Asperger's traits. Yes, I mean that's that's I mean that's very interesting. I, mean, I think it's um, I think I just find it incredibly interesting. I mean, there's a, an amazing book written last year by um, Steve Silverman um, called Neuro Tribes. I really recommend it. It's 480 pages. So it's quite a thing. Was it, what was the title again, Mike? I think it's called oh, is it Neuro Tribes or Neuro Tribes, right? I just want to make sure I get a note of it. I have to right? check that actually. Yeah. Neuro something. Okay. Um, and it's the complete history of autism. I mean, they were just treated so terribly. You know, some, you know, kids were were, were, were told by the parent by their doctor. So, you know, the, sorry, the parents of kids said, right. You know, they've got this feeble mindedness. They were they were called. And the, your only uh, alternative is to, to put you into lockdown ward and burn all the photographs of them. Oh my it's goodness! Just oh appalling. Goodness. Yeah. So things are are get. And it's interesting how. So to begin with, you've got some some enlightened practitioners, then you've got some enlightened parents, sort of organising conferences, and then and then inviting their children themselves, and then the autistic. People in particular started organising their own conferences, and of course they did it completely differently. They'd have chill out spaces. Um, they would, um, you know, sort of make sure there were no sort of flashing lights or, or loud noises. You know, they would just have it the way they wanted to. And I was very amused by one couple. Uh, you know, there's a thing called stimming, and a lot of um, a lot of um, people on the autism spectrum are told this is a bad thing. This is socially unacceptable. You mustn't stim. So these two, when they first, and of course, to begin with, people weren't meeting. So at these conferences, they were actually meeting people like themselves. So two of them, so they went to a, they found a private room and did stimming together, which I thought was really great, you know. Okay. <laughs> stimming is, you know. Yeah. So I think um, I'm just making a really good point. Things like eye contact, um, but whatever, they're, whatever they're difficult. I mean, I think I, I just feel I'm in my infancy in, in my expertise. But my, that can be important for, a therapist to hold in mind that someone might struggle with yeah. um, physical contact or making that immediately upon contact. And it's not necessarily about how the person feels about the relationship, but it might be some other kind of traits, some Asperger's traits that, that if we were mindful about, if we understood, it could be helpful, I guess, in the, in the partnered relationship. Yes. Yeah. Keep thinking we need to have a conference on on working with the autistic spectrum, and because I, I, I don't think um, Anna Kate quite gone to that. I mean, obviously both of them have some experience with that, couldn't they? But, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm diverging. Sorry, I'm a bit like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can see you've just loved that book. Sandra's telling me that she has found the book, so right. it can go in the resource guide. Great. Yes. Oh, and um, Roger's letting us know it's Neuro Tribes. The Legacy of Autism, yes, S. Silberman. Fantastic. It's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, great. I don't normally read books, but I just read it like another. So it's 480 pages, absolutely brilliant. And it's interesting that he, that he himself is gay. 
So I think he's had a sort of tuning in to another kind of um, minority that's perhaps a bit oppressed, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's very sensibly written. Very, very Fantastic. Well, that sounds like a really lovely um, tangent to have gone down. Okay. We've got a little over five minutes left, so the time is um, nearly gone. It always goes so fast, Mike, when you're here <laughs> with us. Um, well, so I've, I've written this, this, this little article. So it's got the complete how I work, if it's sort of crystallized down for better or worse, so people can, can read that. So bits that I've kind of missed out um, are, are, are there, really. I really encourage colleagues to pick up the article either from below the video right now or if you're watching the recording, download the resource guide from the library page. Um, I, I really like, Mike, how you've brought some things that you can suggest to mm. the client. So some things that have maybe worked for you or for other couples. But you're also thinking carefully, it's really about like what would work for this couple? It's not like a formula that you just apply, like next couple, right, this is what you do. It's, no, it's a tricky thing, because again, what Anna and, and Kate were talking about is process. I mean, they were just basically saying what, what they like to do is, is not to kind of short circuit the, the um, client's process. Mm. I know what they mean, but on average, I see people for about four sessions, and that's the average for, for relate as well. That, so. I mean, some people, I've got one couple, they're still here after 30 sessions. I wonder what I'm doing wrong, as it were. But um, on, on average, I'm, I'm expecting to, 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 to work quickly. And there's the expectation of the, uh, the, the couple. That they, they want to work quickly, shorter money, and they want results quickly. Maybe I succumb to that pressure too much. It's, it's a difficult one. Mm -hmm. So I don't feel I've got, I've got necessarily the time to fully do what. So it, it, well, theoretically, I agree with, with, with Kate and Alan about allowing... Um, Clients process, um, but you see, I'm also a great believer that you know what they say is that um, more happens between sessions than during the session, mm. and that can be enhanced by a bit of homework, really, um, because then in a sense that they're taking, they're in charge of their own process, and while they're reflecting by doing communication exercises, then I think they're getting in touch with their own process and aware of it, and it, it, it's, it's sort of thing, perhaps even happening in a sleep. It's, it's, I don't think you can actually make the process move on it's, it's something that, that's just happening really mm, yeah yeah so that's a really interesting way to th think about it like there's something about uh, yeah you can't speed up the process these exercises are not about curing people or uh, making them faster it's um but, but i guess maybe it triggers something that can come back into the next session or you can Yes, maybe. I mean, the first exercise I like to do, the most common, um, is I, I say, look, you've got 10 minutes, phone's off, um, TV off, kids off, you know, <laughs> dogs off, um, <clears throat> give each other full attention. And then the first exercise I, I, I say is like, one of you talks for five minutes without interruption, and then you swap over. So it's not interruptive. It's a listening exercise, and you're li listening as much to yourself as to your partner. The reason why it's no interruption is because it's very rare for people to experience being able to talk without interruption. And it also means that you can self-correct. So you may say something which isn't quite right and would normally have your partner jump down your throat, but, but they're not allowed to. So you say, oh, did I really say that? That's not quite the way I meant it to come out. What I really meant is that. So that they're reflecting on their process by doing that in a, in a sense. Mm -hmm. So again, people accuse me of it's very kind of... Um, Overstructured and formal, um, but I found even so there are other exercises as well. But 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 even when people do that and persevere, it's amazing how much they do make progress in their own terms. So that they feel pleased that things are getting better. Right, right. That's an exercise that people take away and feel like they're able to make more contact with each other. Yeah, yeah. I think another point I haven't stressed enough is I really do regard myself as my own resource. Uh, and I, I would invite other people, if anybody's interested in um, couples counselling, then to, to think about their own relationship in the first instance, you know. And I find it's great. By observing other couples, that helps me improve my own relationship. By observing my own relationship, that, that means I'm more tuned in and sensitive to, um, to couples. It's very rare that couples bring issues that I've not one or another experienced, you know. So I think I've worked through a ver being very dysfunctional, from being dysfunctional to a bit more functional, hopefully, in terms of uh, 
being able to relate. You know. Yeah, well, and thank you for speaking so humbly about your own relationship, Mike. And it sounds like if we can be in that place with our own lives, yes. it also tempers our expectations for our clients too. That we're, it's, it's, I guess we're all human and we're struggling to kind of be ourselves and be in relationship with each other. And it's hard and often we we do things that are unhelpful for each other. And yeah. It, it is hard. It's very hard. I think it's the hardest thing we do. I mean, we could um, put a question out out to the chat room is that who's an expert communicator? You know, but I'm certainly not. You know, I don't know if you are. But yes. I'd love to know if there is that because maybe they should be given this talk if they are. Well, yeah. Perhaps, perhaps, or maybe that's another talk, I guess, but we, yeah, uh, well, there's something here maybe about how we frame the work, it's not about, it, or it doesn't sound like you're saying, right, this is about turning couples into super couples or something that uh, have no difficulties or struggles with each other, but like, but there's some things that you, you've done with couples that are helpful, that are helpful for yourself and... And I think there's a kind of, in school we used to call it the hidden curriculum. So in other words, what's actually happening is not necessarily that apparent. So people are clearly, when they come, they're at a cliff about to fall over. And somehow what's happening is I'm helping them to move a little bit away from the cliff. Mm -hmm. And if they're a little bit away from the cliff, that gives them a bit more space. We sort of pause for thought to, to breathe. And then they can make use of that space. Mm -hmm. so, so that's where I'm, I'm a great believer in... in, in um, you know, so trust in the process. But I think I've got to help them pull away from the from the, from the cliff edge. So it's a sort of, it's a three way mm. task in a sense. Mm. Is that like in a way you're putting your hand out or something, and, and so that people can kind of help themselves and get some help from you. Yes, yeah. I, th I think I think that's it exactly. Yes. But it, exactly how it happens, I think before they know somehow whatever they're doing, even if it's an artificial exercise they suddenly find they are away from the cliff. And that's enormous relief to them. And it's a bit more incentive, therefore, to, to, to try a bit more, you know, to try other things. Keep going and, and do some more, yeah. Mike, our time has come and gone Indeed. today, yes. We've been talking about this event for some time now, haven't we? And uh, I know we were going to do this last autumn and we postponed and... So thank you for your patience, Mike, and, and sticking in with this day. It's been really great. And, and then to have the conversation here, to have your article, it's really great, Mike. Well, it's been absolutely great. I've really enjoyed it. You know, I've really enjoyed seeing the comments that uh, people have, have made in the chat room. It's always, it's always great. It, it, you and I having conversations, it's just really nice because I feel you've got the, uh, the, the uh, chat room participants there and other people who are not actually in the chat room just listening you know i'm sort of really grateful to people who, who, who are willing to come along and listen it's great yes yes absolutely thank you everyone for your attention um today it's been great and um, putting up i think there's been some technical difficulties so thank you um to colleagues who've had them and stuck with us we appreciate it of course you might be picking this up as a recording and we can kind of hopefully feel your presence even if it is from the past, I guess, <laughs> for those who will be watching in the future. And Mike, I know that you've, you've really spent a lot of time thinking and writing for this event, so thank you too for your generosity. We really appreciate it. Well, yeah. thanks for inviting me anyway. Great. So the next time we can have you back at online events, we will, okay. we will look forward to that, Mike, and thank okay. you for yeah. today. Thanks so much indeed, then. Bye.